Thank you above all for inviting me here today. It is indeed a great pleasure and a great honor. And I really feel very humbled by it because truly, as I explained to Peter, I'm not really a scholar scholar. You know, I'm a hobby scholar. And I do scholarship as a hobby. And I have been doing art in various uh, subjects and in various uh, fields. So I have been an editor of Marg Publications. I have, was uh, director of the National Gallery of Modern Art in Mumbai. And so I've shifted fields and I've gone to various uh, areas. And I haven't really stuck to just doing scholarship. And therefore, I feel very honored today that Peter decided to invite me. And an invitation that I accepted with much trepidation because with all these scholars around here, I don't know how this lecture will be, will be received. But I hope you will all enjoy it because truly it's a visual delight. I started studying giant painting as my uh, PhD thesis. And the idea was that uh, though giant painting of the Shwetambar group was very well known, of the Digambars, not much was known. And uh, uh, my advisor, Dr. Moti Chandra, felt that perhaps with our family connections, I would be able to find some interesting things which would help in, uh, in uh, the study of uh, giant art. So I started, as per his wishes, and started going to Jain libraries. And I was indeed extremely happy that on a, one of my initial trips, I went to a place called Karanja. And there, by chance, just by chance, I discovered a painted scroll, which was 40 feet long and three feet wide. It is, uh, I don't really want to go into the details of it, but those are really the beauties of uh, discovering objects when you're doing your study and research. Very often, research can be so frustrating because you may go to various places and not find anything. But this particular, in this instance, I had found some things in the Jain libraries at Karanja. It was my very first um, trip to find objects and to and there as we were about to leave they insisted that I have a cup of tea with them and now you know this is 40 years ago and tea meant that you know it would take time for them to those were the days when it was not always possible to have um, have gas for lighting so it was those primer stoves which they pumped and then they made tea which took about half an hour. So while chatting with them over tea, I asked them that, uh, do you by any chance have anything on cloth? And so they said, yes, we do. We have a painted scroll. And uh, so I said, do you th think I could see it? And uh, they said, certainly, but then it meant getting the key, then it meant getting the, a lamp to see it. <laughs> And it meant going into a storeroom. And that storeroom was so dark. And it was, it, uh, the temple was under repairs. So we found all sorts of objects there, you know, wooden beams and broken glass and bo uh, big, big sort of basins of cement. And it was like going like an obstacle course above the beam and around the cement and around the glass and into the corner where we saw this roll, and it was so dark and so late, so I just said, do you think I could just take a corner and look if it is, if it is something that I'm looking for? And they said, is that the way to look at religious objects? So, of course, I was, I was very sorry I had said that, and I said, no, we'll, we'll take it out. They t took it, and they took it, to the corridor of the temple, which is like a long corridor like this, and they unrolled it like a bolt of cloth. And I just held my breath. I mean, there was this breathtaking scroll, 40 feet long, three feet wide, 
fully painted. So we didn't leave that day. We stayed another two days. We photographed it. And that's how my journey into Indian art began. And today, I would like to share with you. At that time, I thought it was very beautiful, but I didn't realize how important it was. Not only important from the point of view of art history, which was my subject, but also point of view of social situations that occur due to historical circumstances. And as we go along, I'll talk about it so that you can see the, the importance of stylistic development and also how these developments are influenced by circumstances, historical circumstances. I have titled this as The Life of Rishabha because <coughs> this scroll does tell you the life of Rishabha and it is in keeping with the title of the seminar here today. But primarily, this scroll has only a few episodes from the life of Rishabha. It dis uh, discusses the Panchakalyana of Rishabha, which are the five important episodes that occur in the life of every Tirthankar. But the vision is so wonderful, and so I've just titled it The Life of Rishabha, A Painted Vision. This is, no. this is how long the scroll is, and it's divided. Sorry, <laughs> I, I can't see. OK. <coughs> this is how long the scroll is, and it's divided into panels, as you can see. And in groups of panels, the Pancha Kalyanak is, dis, uh, is displayed. And I have. <coughs> shown you the Panchakalyanak here. This is the Garbha Kalyanak. This is the Janma Kalyanak. It's such a big length of Janma Kalyanak. Then we have a small bit of uh, Diksha Kalyanak. This is, uh, this is Keval Gyan Kalyanak, and this is Moksha Kalyanak. So from this, you can see how much importance is given to this. And this is what is so different about the scroll. Because generally, in giant painting, we don't find so much description and so much importance given to each of the Kalyanaks. But here, there is a certain celebratory, joyful depiction. And this is, in many ways, contrary to what you usually see in giant paintings, which are extremely matter of fact. They just tell you the story in bare and bald terms. Very little landscape or architecture is shown, but this particular scroll in that sense is very unusual and very beautiful. Panchakalyanak is probably, it's extremely important to the Jains, and it is shown in various manners. It is shown as fresco paintings, as you see over here. These are from uh, Tiruputti Kunnaram. Then sometimes the entire episode is not shown. It's only shown by certain symbols like this, which is Samav Saran, which is Keval Gyan's uh, Kalyanak. This is again Keval Gyan Kalyanak in bronze. This is a painting. And this is a wooden carving in a wooden mandap. And it shows this. This is Janma Kalyanak of an elephant showing with many trunks and tusks and lotus lakes on top and Apsaras dancing on it. So this is the way in which the Kalyanaks are shown. They're often shown singly not always collectively. And just by looking at one, you know what it represents. <coughs> the scroll begins with Adai Dweep. This is the manner in which most in uh, Jain stories begin with the picture of Adai Dweep. This picture is sort of turned. This should have been horizontal. But it is here 
where we have the city of Ayodhya. I'm sorry, this is, yeah, this should be, anyway, this is where the city of Ayodhya is, which is where the story of Rishabha takes place. Sorry, I think I've gone ahead. This is the city of Ayodhya that is first shown in the first panel, as you can see here. Each panel is shown where its position is by showing it to you here. And this is where it is. And these are some details from it over here, this figure over here, and some of these details here. Now, the, according to the text of the Adi Puran, the city of Ayodhya was built by Indra six months before Rishabha was born. He built this city on the lines of cities in heaven. And in the center of the city, he situated a palace for the parents of Rishabha, which is Nabiraj and Marudevi. And in and because the Tirthankar was going to be born then, he situated he made the city very big with lots of mansions and populated it with people that were scattered all over the earth and brought them together at Ayodhya. Here we see this figure of Nabiraj and his wife Marudevi. And again, which is a convention in miniature painting, you see Nabiraj again with his courtiers. And this wonderful palace shown with a garden and two walls, one made of mud, one made of stone, and people over here indulging in daily activities. There are some quite interesting little uh, details here. Here's a man chasing an elephant. Here's a woman buying pan. So these are the sort of details that you find showing people of Ayodhya. <coughs> then <coughs> one night when Marudevi was sleeping, at the end of the night she saw 16 lucky dreams. The first dream that she shown, saw was an elephant, Airavata. The dreams start from here. This is Marudevi sleeping, and these are her dreams. I'll just read out the dreams to you. There was the elephant, Airavata, trumpeting like a thunder rain cloud, a splendid white bull with broad shoulders, a white lion with reddish shoulders, the goddess Shri, this is elephant, this is the sequence in which it goes. The goddess Shri seated and being lustrated by celestial elephants, a pair of fragrant flower garlands surrounded by humming bees. Uh, the full moon ringed with stars, the su rising sun, two golden jars covered with lotuses, um, a pair of fish sporting in a lotus lake, a lake covered with pollen like melted gold, an ocean with splashing waves, which you get here. These, the scroll was quite damaged, so all these parts are gone. You know, this, this shows the sort of repairs that were done. Uh, a high lion throne, a celestial vehicle, a mansion from the netherworlds, a heap of sparkling jewels, and a bright smokeless fire. At the end of the night, <clears throat> Marudevi got up and she went to her husband and she told him about the dreams and he interpreted them for her. He said the elephant meant that her son was, will be of unsurpassed excellence the bull indicated that he would tower over others. The lion signified that he would possess immense strength. The garlands indicated that he would establish a religious order. The lustration of Lakshmi symbolized their son's lustration on Meru. A moon meant, the moon meant that he would be brilliant. 
The two jars served as emblems of countless good qualities. The fish meant that he would be happy. The lotus lake signified that his body would bear auspicious signs. The throne meant that he would reign on earth. The celestial carriage indicated that he would descend from the sky. The Naga Viman from the netherworld meant that he would be clairvoyant, and the heap of jewels meant that he would be virtuous. The smokeless fire indicated that he would reduce all his karmas to ashes. Now, <clears throat> so this is, these are the lucky dreams, and this is the interpretation of it. And some details for you to see how beautifully it is done. Especially look at the colors and the detailing of the uh, animal. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, this seems to be going faster. Than <laughs> now, when Varudevi got these dreams, Indra felt a quivering of his throne, and he sent down six kumarikas. These are the Shatta kumarikas. Which a detail of which you see here, and this over here. And these kumarikas came with marvelous substances to clean and the womb of Maru Devi for the Tirthankar to take, uh, you know, to come into her womb. So these are the Shatta kumarikas. They are Ri, 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 Shri, Ri, Dhruti. Kirti, Buddhi, and Lakshmi. So these are the six Shatakumarikas who come, are sent by uh, Indra from above. I'm sorry, I don't know what is going wrong. Huh? This is the interpretation of dreams. Then after that, Indra sent 56 Dikka Kumarikas to wait on Maru Devi. And this is truly a very beautiful miniature painting where you see Maru Devi seated in the center. All these Kumarikas are around her. And what is wonderful is if you really observe the composition, look at the way in which it goes from here. Then it goes around here. So the eye of the uh, observer moves with these and comes back to her because it comes like this and back to her. It's a very beautiful, artistically composed composition. And these are the Dikka Kumarikas who are seated and praying with her. The Dikka Kumarikas looked after her for all the nine months that she was there. They uh, cooked for her. They looked after her, uh, her um, personal needs they looked at they played with her they entertained her they uh, um, amused her with riddles they sported with her and they even discussed poetry and literature with her so she was stimulated by their company and also well look, looked after by them It is important as artistry goes, uh, the way in which these women are shown, you know, their dress, their ornaments, their deportment, their gestures, and the way they stand. This is this group here. And Indra started to throw gems and gold to enrich the earth in before Rishabha would be born. Sorry. After nine months, Rishabha was born. And in the morning, all these uh, musicians played music. And when Indra heard, he also showered the earth with gold. And when he heard that the child was born, he sent Indrani, which you see here, to bring the child. The idea was that she would place a mock child in front with the mother, throw the mother in a deep slumber, 
to substitute the child and take the infant Rishabha for his lustration rites on Mount Meru. So this is the mother, this is the child, and this is Indrani picking up the child. Notice the ornaments, you know, these sort of ornaments and the dress, all the wonderful gold and colors, brocades that we see here. These all indicate the sort of courtly uh, vision that we want to see. Here we see Indrani coming here with the child, and this is Indra on his Airavat with many trunks and tusks, lotus lakes, and dancing apsaras on them. And these are the heavenly hosts that come with him. So Indrani takes the child and gives it to Indra, who puts him in his lap. The detail of Indrani. Her very attenuated form and slender, very attractive depiction. We are here now. We are seeing the Garbha Kalyana, I mean the Janma Kalyana, the birth. Now Indrani giving the child to Indra. Then Indra with the child and with all the accompanying gods and other, uh, his Indra Sena, as these are called, move, moves towards Mount Meru. Look at the rendition of the elephant, how beautifully it is done. And you know, it's about three feet, so about the size you see here. And these are the Apsaras. Some more of the same panel. That's him here. This figure here. This here. And I think on one of the horses. Or oh, this one. Look at his posture, you know, the contraposto in which he is shown. <clears throat> and how brilliant the colors are, the reds, and interestingly, the pinks and the violets that you see here, the blues. All these are very interesting, very interesting palette. Oh, I think this movement Sorry, this is, we've seen this, now we go to this. This is the lustration rites on Mount Meru. They say when the procession came, it circumambulated the Mount Meru, and then it climbed all the way up here. And on the Pandukshila here, there was the lustration rites that were being performed. They were performed with the waters of Kshir Sadar, which were filled by pitchers, by gods in pitchers, and passed from hand to hand all the way up on both sides. So it's a wonderful landscape that we see here. And the Mount Meru is completely made of gold. A very beautiful figure here. The lustration rites are taking place here and all the gods are accompanying them and music being played. And on the return, the elephant assumes this form. It is one of the most beautiful uh, and really imaginative ways in which I have seen in uh, Airavata done. I've seen many pictures of Airavat like this, but it would be shown with three or four tusks. But look at these tusks and the way in which these uh, lotuses are held by this wonderful composition here and this entire lotus lakes with dancing up sarhas. And we have all these figures, details. 
We are here now. It's the same, same uh, panel, but enlarged here for you to see how it is done and the little detail here. There's a certain rhythm and uh, almost like music in the way in which this figure is done. This little detail is from here. After the illustration writes, Indrani brings the child <coughs> and returns the, the baby to the, uh, to the parents and there he is seated here in his father's lap. These are courtiers, and this is Nabiraj, this is Marudevi. And see, the, the event was the birth of the Jinnah was celebrated with great festivity. And seeing the jubilation, Indra got very excited and he started to dance. And this is Indra dancing, a detail of his Look at the shading, the way the eye is done, all the saffron put on his face, the shading of the face. Very beautifully done. This is also the color of the dhoti is very elegant. And all the, the gods started playing music for him. And Indra danced so beautifully. He danced in a manner in which sometimes he was, was seemed far away, sometimes he seemed near, sometimes he made himself small, sometimes he made himself big, so he took all sorts of shape, I mean sizes, and he danced beautifully with these apsaras on his multiple hands. This, this is the end of Janma Kalyanak. This is how big it is in the scroll, and this is the figure that we see here. Now, these are the three scenes we have from the life of Rishabha, which, which uh, usually do not occur in Panchakalyanaka events, but these are shown here. Here he is shown as a child playing with other young princes and young Devakumar, so the little godlings here. And there's again a nice rhythm to the whole composition. <clears throat> After that, we get his coronation, uh, his wedding. Here he is seated. He marries two princesses, as you can see here. This is Yashasvi, this is Sunanda. They were sisters and they were both married to him. And this is the wedding ceremony, the people and these. Uh -huh. Even as we have today in many weddings, these uh, handas put one on top of another. And thereafter, this scene goes like this. Thereafter, we have the, the continuity of the story goes like this. There's a panel here, but it doesn't, it doesn't belong to his life scenes. And this is the coronation of him becoming the king of Ayodhya. Now 
Now, there are three scenes that we see together. This, it's this one and these two. This should have been here. But anyway, when Rishabha was enjoying his life on earth and enjoying all the, uh, the pleasures associated with kingship, and he was ruling the people very well, teaching them various professions, also telling them what where the town should be, what they should be called, etc., etc. And then Indra felt that it was time for Rishabha to, to really propagate the Jain religion. That was the reason why he was born, and that is what we should do be doing. So Indra comes, and he brings with him a dancer called Nilanjana, whose life was almost coming to an end. And he decided, he came and she danced for Rishabha. Rishabha is sitting here with his courtiers. And she danced. But as her life ended, she staggered and fell and died. Indra immediately substituted another dancer. And a lot of people didn't even realize what had happened. But Rishabha realized and he began to feel that the futility of life and how it could end suddenly. And then his resolve to sort of renounce life. Then the Lokantika gods come and they encourage him to renounce life. So then what he does is his two sons, one is Bharata, the other is Bahubali. He, give, he crowns them both. Bharata becomes the, uh, the, after him, succeeds him. This is the crown prince and both were their coronation ceremonies were, take, were taking place as he embarked on his renunciation rites. So what he does is he's shown here in his renunciation palanquin, accompanied by gods and by, uh, by his courtiers, and they all take him outside the town into a wood where he would do his renunciation rites. So here is the scene of Nilanjana falling, the Lokantika gods coming and worshipping him and asking him to take up the mission for which he was born on earth. Here is Rishabha. So these are these two scenes occur simultaneously. On one side, the coronation of the two princes is taking place. On the other side, Rishabha is leaving his kingdom and going to become a homeless mendicant monk. Hmm. We are here now. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. Here we are, sorry. <laughs> I, this is so sensitive that a little movement also makes the slides change. Hmm? Which one? Yeah, yeah. Here we are. There he goes in the Siddhartha woods and pulls out his hair in five handfuls, which are accepted by Indra, and then Indra throws them into the ocean of milk. But with him, a number of other kings also took diksha, and so they are shown here, taking their, as renouncing the world also. This is him. We have now the 36 emblems of the 24 Tirthankars. 
I am personally not quite sure why this has been put here, but uh, and uh, many of the persons who were there at Karanja, I asked them, and they were also not able to quite give me the reason of why this particular panel is inserted in this position. But these are the 24 emblems of the 24 Tithankaras. Now this comes as the Keval Gyan Kalyanak of where the Rishabha receives his uh, omniscience. When he received, when all he received omniscience, Indra and the other gods came down and they, they built the Samavasaran. Samavasaran meaning a place where everyone can get knowledge. And he comes and builds this circular Samavasaran. As it, the texts describe it as, there uh, was a circular space made of blue crushed gems and then it had four radial pathways and there were many concentric circles in between. The first one consisted of step wells or in some places they say certain uh, stupas, but anyway, various descriptions in texts differ. But this, according to the Adi Puran, which I have been following, says this was the Dhuli Shala made of many crushed gems of various colors. So it was radiant like a rainbow. Inside was the region of step wells. Then came the region of uh, the waters, sparkling waters with aquatic animals in it. And then came the region of bowers where creepers and shrubs and trees grew and within them were beautiful slabs of moonstone to, to rest on. This is the region of Bowers. Then was the first enclosure in gold and then we have um, the, well these don't really quite correspond to the uh, textual things but this is supposed to be the woods. There were four types of woods, then there were flags that you see here. Then there was another enclosure. Then you get the Kalpavrakshas and you get the mansions. After that was the crystal wall. Within that was an open area within which was built a mandapa with 12 sections for different types of gods and people to sit. Also animals. And very often you were shown animals, though not here, which are inimical to each other. So you would see a snake and a goat or something like that, or a tiger and a goat. And there in the center was built a Gandakuti, which was three-tiered with a lotus throne on which was seated Rishabha. And he was seated in such a manner that he could be seen from all four sides. Although he was facing east, all, from all sides you could see him as, you know, like a four-sided figure. And while he was seated there, as he becomes now, is ready to be called a Tithankar, he has these eight symbols around him. These are the Ashoka tree, which I think you see here. The Ashoka tree, the parasol, the throne, then there is the halo, which you don't see here. Halo, then there is Pushpa Vrishti, or heaven, shower of heavenly flowers, then celestial music, and drums. Here, you see the drums here. This is the Pushpa Vrishti, the lion throne. The halo should have been here. So, and the Chauri bearers that you see here. These people would have been the Chauri bearers here. So these eight symbols accompany the Tirthankar wherever he goes. And the whole Samar Sharan meet, uh, moves with him when he spreads the mes message of Jainism. His, when he spoke, it was, he did not speak like in ordinary words. He said, when he spoke, it was like the roar of the oceans. But the message was clear. Everyone could understand what he was saying. And then his Ganadharas took his, or his disciples, took his teachings and made them into 12 sections. So this is the yantra or the symbol which represents his 12, teach, uh, 12 sections of his teachings. 
So all this is part of the Samavsaran. The Samavsaran moved with him to various regions. He went to uh, different cities and different areas. And finally, he comes to Kailas. And here at Kailas, this is the detail of Kailas. Look how beautifully the rocks are shown. Um, he attains Keval Jnana, where his soul goes up all the way to the Loka and finds rest on Siddha Shila over here, where he, his soul rests in total bliss. And this is the Kailas, this, the Ashtapada here, and there he is seated, where he attains uh, moksha. So this is the way in which this is, is painted. And <clears throat> it was rather surprising for us to see this. And at first, when we looked at it, sorry, we felt that this scroll must have been painted at in Rajasthan because it had many of the features that you associate with the paintings of Rajasthan, particularly of Mewad. These two are from Mewad. This is also from Mewad, this is from Malwa, and this is from Bundi. But you know the red coloring, the sort of blues, and all that that I use, the way the figures are done, all that indicated that it was done in Rajasthan. However, when you take a closer look at the paintings of the scroll, what we noticed was that it had many features that allied to Bundi painting. You see the way in the, which these faces are done. Look at the way these faces are done. This ruddiness of the faces is a very typically Bundi trait. And we felt that it was allied to Bundi. School of Bundi and School of Bundi painting. Then we, you take another closer look and you find that it is the way in which these figures are put and composed. The coloring here, we can't see it as much, but the same coloring as this. And in general, the, uh, the figures, the tall, lissom figures, their dress, their deportment, their gestures, their ornaments, all that sort of resembled the painting here from Bikaner. So was this scroll done at Bikaner? And then on, at the same time, seeing those Rajasthani traits, we felt it was from Rajasthan, but we also saw things that allied it to Deccani paintings. You know, this, this is a, a Pichwai from Masili Putam. And you see this, this sort of way in which this is done. This is much more simplified, but the feeling is the same. So it was again a, a sort of question. Could it have been done in the Deccan? Again, this is from the Deccan. And comparisons with the Deccan, if you see here, see these where uh, sort of compartments surrounding the middle space, which is again in two registers, you sort of see the same composition. This again is a cloth painting done for the European market in Golconda, dated 1635-1645. See in the way in which this panel is composed and this panel is composed. The architecture reminded us of some of the later paintings from Hyderabad or Golconda, which was earlier Golconda. Look at the way in which the architecture is, you know, the central pavilion with two side pavilions, the sort of uh, pavilions, terrace pavilions over here, the uh, Bengal roofs that you see here, and the, the, so, uh, the garden over here, here. So again, again, even the rendering of the female figures and the way they are composed so had certain similarities and affinities to 
Deccani painting. Here again, in a procession scene, you know, the central figure and the way in which these figures are surrounded, the way they are walking. These, I mean, these are not identical uh, comparisons. These give you a feeling, a sense of similarity. When you look at it, these are the sort of similarities you begin to see. And this, again, is a painting from the Deccan. Again, a painting from the Deccan. See this sort of circular, semicircular composition, the way in which these figures stand, even their facial features and some very similar big eyes, short cholis, long but, uh, uh, petticoats, and these white sort of vatkas. Again, to Deccani painting, we see the treatment of the trees, you know, these sort of circular foliage, you know, so arranged in foliage. Again, the way in which the tree trunks are white against the foliage. Here again, circular uh, clumps of foliage. The way in which these, see these rocks are done, coloring, in general, we found more resemblances to the Deccani school than Rajasthani school. Though the overall feeling was Rajasthani, there were many features that allied it to the Deccani schools. Now, this particular painting that we have here, these paintings, these three paintings are from a Rasmanjari that was painted in the Deccan for a Rajasthani patron from Mewar in 1650 at Aurangabad. And seeing this, which also has several Deccani features, many more paintings, but again, the coloring, the sort of way in which people sit, their dress, you can see the similarities here. You can see the similarities here. Look at the coloring. Look at the coloring here. This is supposed to be more pink. And then we have other paintings which appear to be done in the Deccan. And here, you know, again, the similarity of the figures. So we began to feel that this scroll was done in the Deccan, in Aurangabad, where the Rasamanjari was done. This is a dated uh, manuscript that we have, which says that it was done for a Mewar chieftain in Aurangabad. Now, so far, we had no idea that there was a school of painting in Aurangabad. And uh, when you think of the historical circumstances that I mentioned earlier, the wars in the Mughal wars in the Deccan, which started in the 17th century, circa 1600. In 1600, the Mughals had conquered um, Ahmadnagar, and they had established their rule in northern Deccan and Aurangabad had become a center for Mughals. And from there, they directed their troop movements, they planned their strategies, but Deccan was the place, and Aurangabad was the pla uh, place in the Deccan from where all this uh, campaigns, Mughal campaigns were taking place because they wanted to subjugate the uh, sultanates of the Deccan. The wars in the Deccan went on for very long. And many of, the, many of the commanders in the Deccan army were Rajasthani princes. We know that the kings of Bikaner were there from circa 1600 to 1685. And it was four generation of kings of Bikaner, starting from, we have uh, Karan Singh, then his son Mohan Singh, then his son Anup Singh. All these people served in the armies in the Deccan. Similarly, Rao Bhau Singh of Bundi was in the Deccan. He stayed there until 1681. 
must have stayed there for 30, 40 years, and he died there. And he erected many buildings in Aurangabad. So the presence of the chieftains of Rajasthan in Aurangabad is very strong. And since the wars were so prolonged, many of the people probably set up, many of these Rajasthani kings set up their establishments in the Deccan. So in, mainly in Aurangabad. And you begin to feel that when they set up their establishments, they must have brought their court there. They must have brought their courtiers, which must have consisted also of people like poets and artists who came and painted in Aurangabad. So Aurangabad now, in circa 1650 to 1700, becomes a strong center of painting. And this, the painting that happens in Aurangabad is combines two schools, Rajasthani and Deccani. And later on, the Mughal influences also come in because the dispersed artists from the Mughal courts, since Aurangzeb, who ruled from 1650 onwards, <coughs> was not at all interested in painting, those artists must have come to the Mughal center in Aurangabad. And after 1680s, the Deccani sultanates were demolished, and their painters also must have come to Aurangabad. So you get this synthesis of many columns coming to Aurangabad, and the painting there is Rajasthani nuanced with the Deccani elements, or Deccani in feeling, but many Rajasthani elements in it. So this fusion occurs, and it's a fusion that doesn't have a distinctive style, but a varied style, including all sorts of elements, and really quite a delightful idiom, and quite poetic in many of its expressions. Now, when these kings came there, they must have also, some of their artisans or some of their tradespeople must have accompanied them to satisfy their specific needs. And these tradespeople, this is where our interest comes in, because with the Mughal campaigns, you find that the movements from north to south had become very common, and the roads had opened up. It had allowed mobility of people and artists and all these people, with the result that you have lots of tradespeople coming there. And those people started settling down in the Deccan, but they brought their Rajasthani ways with them. And then after the Mughal Wars were over, maybe they settled in different places in uh, the Deccan. And this is where we find, <coughs> this is Karanja, the place where we got the scroll. There are three Bhattarak seats in Karanja, one of Moola Sangha, one of Kashta Sangha, and one of Senghan. So it was an important center of the Jains. And the Jains, who are really not landowners and therefore not attached to land, must have moved wherever they saw opportunities for trade. And the Mughal encampment, it is said, was like a town. It needed so many things that, they, and they were suppliers were needed for provisions, for providing cloth, for providing items of daily use. And these move, people moved in. Also, many of the giants who money lenders who must have found a lot of opportunities for trade there. So people from Rajasthan come there, and people from Bundi Kota came and settled in Karanja. And in this place, in a mandir in this city, you find the scroll was there. And this explains the Rajasthani and Deccani elements in the style of the scroll, and particularly the Bundi elements, because the temple, the congregation of the temple is Bundi, from Bundi. They are Bagarwals of Bundi. And they don't remember where they, when they came there, though they do say that it must be over three or four hundred years ago. And they say that they, they have been very clannish. They did not, even though they are naturalized and they wear Maharashtrian clothes and the food has become Maharashtrian, they do not marry Maharashtrians. They go back to Bundi for, uh, for getting a bride or getting a groom, and then they come back. So this community has been very clannish, and they have kept their clannish ways and their Bundi ways, and maybe that is how they must have 
invited an artist from Aurangabad to, with Bundi affiliations, to paint the scroll for them. Now, whether it was a leader of the community or whether it was the congregation that invited these artists, we do not know. But we do know that there is a connection between the scroll and the, paint, uh, and the uh, congregation of the Sen Gan Mandir where it was found. And the Bundi connection can be sort of explained as these people from Bundi coming to the Deccan for trade purposes and probably to supply goods to the Mughal army and the Rajasthani noblemen that were involved in the Mughal wars. So here we find something quite different and interesting in the way the confluence of influences take place and the sort of expression that emerges out of it. Thank you very much. <laughs>